Welcome to worship at Crossroads United Methodist Church. We hope this will be a wonderful inspiration for you today. Good morning, church. My name is Julie Shindell, and I am the pastor at Crossroads United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you are worshiping with us this morning. Whether it is your first time joining us or you're one of our regulars, it is good to have you with us today, and we celebrate the chance to praise God and worship the Lord. Today we are celebrating uh, back to school, whether that's going to be virtually or in person. We are so grateful for all of you who have brought school supplies already. Uh, we are continuing to collect school supplies for Hightower Trail Elementary School. What they're going to do is make some to-go bags for all the students and for teachers who are going to be learning online. So this is an opportunity for you to help make virtual learning even easier. You can still drop off school supplies on today, Sunday, August 9th, between 2 and 4 p.m. There's going to be a shopping cart outside the portico and you can drop off your school supplies there. But today, especially as we are preparing for back to school beginning August 24th, we want to let our teachers and our administrators and all of our educators and school workers know we are thinking about you and praying for you. For all of the parents who are having to make tough decisions about whether to be online or whether to go back to school, there are so many major decisions happening and we are also praying for you. For our students who this school year is not what you were hoping it was going to be, maybe it looks a little bit different. Maybe you're excited about getting to have school in your pajamas. Uh, we want, to know, want you to know we are also praying for you and lifting you up as well for a great start to a new school year. We want to give thanks and offer a blessing for these school supplies, for the students and teachers who will be using them, and give thanks to God for all of the ways God is in the classroom in so many different ways and so many different places this new year. Let us pray and give thanks. Loving and most gracious God, we truly and humbly thank you. We ask that you bless these school supplies, these pens and crayons, these folders and notebooks. We ask that each student and teacher who uses them will know of your presence and feel your love. We ask that you will keep our students and educators safe. We ask that you will give them a good learning environment this year. And we ask that you give them an opportunity uh, to put forth all that they have and all that they are in their learning and in their teaching. We thank you for this congregation, for their generosity, and the ways that they support our elementary school next door. And we thank you for that partnership as well. Lord, we bless these school supplies and ask that as each person is using them, they will think of you and they will feel loved and cared for. Let it be a great school year. Let it be a wonderful opportunity to grow in their education. And Lord, we give all the thanks and glory to you. Amen. As we continue to worship this morning, I invite you to get settled in, uh, turn your thoughts and your hearts to God as we begin and worship. I invite you to sing with us as we join our praise band for our first song.
Matthew 14, 22 through 33. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly the Son of God. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All over the news this week, there are stories of places that have reopened to the public. One such place is Disney World, uh, who put in numerous efforts to offer social distancing, uh, extra precautions and safety measures for guests to enjoy the most magical place on earth. But the stories about Disney this week weren't anything related to COVID-19. Instead, there was a story about a boat. Did you see this? Apparently, one of the log flumes on the ride Splash Mountain had five guests on it, and toward the end of the ride started taking on too much water and began to sink. Obviously, if your boat is sinking and you're right next to land, even if it's AstroTurf and animatronics, you're gonna get out of the boat. So that's what these guests did. They got out of their boat and onto the side of the ride. And just as they stepped out, their boat became completely submerged with water. Once they thought they'd reached safety, a Disney cast member began chastising them, saying they should have stayed in their boat. Pointing at the underwater vessel, they exclaimed, do you see our boat? And the cast member reminds them that where they are, it's a safety hazard to get out of the boat. It seems there are times when getting out of the boat is a better idea than staying in it, especially when it's sinking. But what if your boat is in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and there's a storm surrounding you? That seems to be a time when it's better to stay inside the boat. Peter, however, had other ideas. Jesus had sent the disciples ahead of him in the boat and he was going to catch up later. Remember that this is only the next day after Jesus found out his cousin, John the Baptist, had been beheaded. And then immediately huge crowds followed him that he spent time healing and feeding with two fish and five loaves. Jesus finally took that moment to be alone, to grieve, and to pray. Now he was ready to rejoin his disciples, but the way he caught up to them was a little frightening. The disciples saw Jesus walking on water and thought he was a ghost. And Jesus said, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter wanted proof it wasn't a ghost, so he said to Jesus, If it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, Come. Think about this for a minute. Why would Peter need proof? Didn't he recognize Jesus? It had only been a few hours since he'd last seen him. I mean, how much could he have changed? Have you ever been in a situation where you saw someone out of context and didn't recognize them? Maybe you saw your doctor at the grocery store and didn't recognize her without the white coat. Or maybe you're seeing people around town with sunglasses on and a mask on, and suddenly it's very hard to recognize anyone. Jesus was doing something they had not witnessed before. He was walking on water, so instead of instantly recognizing Jesus, in this context, they were afraid. If Peter really thought it was a ghost, however, why on earth did he want to get out and get closer? 
My first Advent at Crossroads, we did a study on Adam Hamilton's book, Simon Peter, and in it he explained that they didn't have the tools to measure the depth of the Sea of Galilee, so there was a tradition that it was an endless portal to the underworld or the realm of the dead. And seeing a figure walk on water through a storm, the disciples thought Jesus was one of those ghosts who had escaped. Anytime we have something that is immeasurable, it can seem scary and overwhelming. We now have better tools to measure the bottom of the ocean in some parts, but some things still remain unknown. We aren't dealing with a measurable depth in a body of water, but we are dealing with an immeasurable amount of time before our world goes back to normal. We aren't sure when coronavirus cases will steadily decline, when a vaccine will be available, or when some of our favorite activities like singing in church will be safe again. This immeasurable unknown before us can be scary and frustrating and make us uneasy. So when we're in that situation, where do we turn?
What do you think Peter was looking for? Was he looking for proof that Jesus wasn't some escaped undead from the realm below? Was he looking for an adventure or even a chance to show off to the disciples? What Peter was looking for was something that wasn't in the boat. And in that moment, Jesus wasn't in the boat. Peter was willing to risk everything in order to be where Jesus was and do what Jesus was doing. This isn't the first time the disciples have been in a boat during the storm. The Sea of Galilee is in this basin of sorts, kind of sunk beneath mountains on most sides. So it's not uncommon for winds to quickly appear out of nowhere. The last time we hear about such a storm, the disciples woke Jesus up from a nap in the boat, insisting that he calm the storm, and he did. Why didn't Peter ask Jesus to do the same this time? Why did he ask to walk on water in the middle of a storm instead of asking Jesus to calm the seas? The great thing about Peter is that he keeps moving forward. He believes this to be Jesus, so he already knows he can calm the seas. Instead, Peter wants to take a risk and do what Jesus is doing. He sees him walking on water and says, I want to do that. I want to be just like Jesus. So he's willing to look like a total fool. He's willing to fail in order to try something new to be more like Jesus. A lot of our church these days is on social media, and we often worship on Facebook or YouTube. As a pastor, I'm constantly looking at what other pastors and churches are doing, and a lot of times I see things and think, I want to do that. It's a brilliant idea to serve in the community or to connect with a certain age group or ideas to invite the neighbors to participate. That's a great way to get our congregation involved. Now the question is, how can we translate that to meet the needs in Conyers? How can we make that work with our people of Crossroads. Peter did much the same. He saw Jesus doing something extraordinary and Peter wanted to be a part of it. It's the epitome of our Christian faith. We see Jesus doing something and we want to do the same. Now we may only want to be like Jesus when he's doing cool magic tricks like turning water into wine or walking on water. Perhaps we're less excited to be like Jesus when he's causing political unrest and when he's getting threatened with execution. But Peter wants to try something new, so he's willing to take a risk to be like Jesus. He's willing to fail forward faster. I've shared this phrase with y'all before, to fail forward faster. It comes from a learning community called MLab that I participated in a couple of years ago. We learned that most people or companies never make any progress or achieve great discoveries because they aren't willing to fail. We live in a society that praises success, but so often success requires a lot of unsuccessful outcomes first. One of my favorite Disney movies is Meet the Robinsons. In it, a young boy named Lewis is a budding inventor, but his inventions keep failing. Frustrated, he gives up until a stranger from the future encourages him to keep trying. At one point, he's so excited to show off a new invention to this new family he has met, and it fails miserably. As he gets upset and frustrated, the entire family begins to cheer. Hooray, you failed! Lewis is so confused why they would celebrate failure until he realizes that every time he makes a mistake, he gets that much closer to getting it right the next time. He learns to fail forward faster. As a church, we are in a season of trying new things. We're in a period of risk-taking and figuring out what works and what doesn't. When we can't have business as usual or worship as we desire, we're looking at new ways to be like Jesus. When Lewis learned to embrace his failures, he started making progress towards successes. When Peter learned to take risks, he looked like a fool from time to time, but he has remained in history as one of the most beloved disciples of all time. How can we as the church look for similar ways to get out of the boat? How can we take risks to be more like Jesus? How can we recognize where Jesus is already at work and encourage ourselves to join in. 
Most of the time when Jesus was teaching or healing or performing miracles, he was out in the community. We very rarely see him in the temple waiting for people to come to him. He was out in the neighborhood sharing the good news and he found people where they were. When the disciples started doing the same, it was not without risk. When they became apostles and were sent out to heal in the name of Jesus, they were told if one community, community didn't accept them, to shake the dust from their feet and keep moving on to the next one. Fail forward faster. If we weren't afraid of failure, what would we be willing to try as a community? What would our church look like if we put everything into living the gospel and doing everything in our ability to be closer to Jesus? Peter was an act first, think later kind of guy. He always wanted to be where Jesus was and he would do anything to be near him. He jumped out of boats, not just in stormy waters, but after Jesus's resurrection. Peter couldn't wait to see him again, so he jumped out of his boat and swam to shore to greet him. He was willing to live the gospel and he often took risks. He sometimes looked foolish. The only time he played it safe was when he was denying Jesus and then deeply regretted it. Peter's goal wasn't for the thrill of adventure, but to be more like Jesus. His first instinct was to jump. Perhaps ours should be too. Thank you. 
It is always a joy and an honor to lift our voices to God in prayer. Today we celebrate with David and Dana Hammonds, who celebrated their 28th wedding anniversary on August 1st. We do extend our Christian love and sympathy to the family of Carol Jordan, who was killed in a motorcycle accident last weekend. We pray for Neil Hester, who has returned to Rockdale Hospital. He was not making improvements as quickly enough after his fall, so doctors are hoping to get him in rehab to speed along his recovery. We pray for Helen Rooks, who is hospitalized at Morgan Memorial, being treated for pneumonia. We pray for Sherry Hansen, who fell and has a badly sprained ankle. We pray for her healing. We pray for David Hammond's parents, Wayne and Norma Hammond's, who are having health issues. We pray for Mallory Hammond's, who's been diagnosed with three different autoimmune diseases. We pray for her, her family, and her doctors as they figure out a treatment plan. We continue praying for those who are undergoing cancer treatment, including Paul Wine, Larry Reed, Steve Powers, Dr. Lisa Miller, and Jessica Dollar. We continue to pray for Cheryl Koppel, who is healing from her hand surgery. We also continue praying for Deborah Willis's granddaughter, Aniston Curls, uh, who fractured her spine in a diving accident. She is recovering at home, but she still has a long way to go. We continue to pray for uh, Brenda Hudson as she recovers from a recent surgery. We also continue to pray for Fred Watson as he recovers from COVID-19 at home and also additional cancer treatment. We pray with Natalie Smith and Alexis Nation for their friend Morgan Poole Walker, who's on a respirator at Emory as doctors are still trying to find the source of an infection. We pray with Nancy Christman for the family of firefighter Steve Smith who passed away this last weekend. We continue to pray for our frontline workers from our congregation and elsewhere who continue to battle the rising number of COVID-19 cases. Let us pray. Loving most gracious God, we give thanks that we can come to you when our lists are long and our worries are great. We give thanks that even when we have no idea what to say, you listen and you hear us. Lord, reveal yourself to us because we understand that there are times when you are near, but we don't even recognize you. Come to us and remind us not to be afraid. Give us the courage to take a risk and come to you where you are, to follow you, to walk as you walked. And when we stumble and are afraid, when we feel like we are sinking, reach out your hand to us and steady us once more. We give thanks that you are near to the brokenhearted, that you can heal the sick and comfort the afflicted. 
We pray that we too can be part of the solution and offer ourselves to care for those we hold so dear. Lead us to be your disciples, whether we are stuck in a boat or boldly jumping forward. Teach us to continue ministering to others until everyone comes to know your name and your great love. We continue to pray as you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. As our time today comes to a close, it has been so good to worship together and to be with one another. We continue to give thanks for all of our educators, all of our students who are going back to school in just a short time. We pray for those who have already returned to school who are going back to buildings and pray for their continued safety. We give thanks for the opportunity to pray together, to read scripture together, to study God's word together. And so as you go from this place, whether you're staying in your living room, whether you're heading back to work tomorrow, uh, whether you are going back to a normal routine or still waiting for that to happen, as we read scripture and as we are reminded of Peter, the disciple, let us be like Peter. Let us be bold. Let us take risks. Let us faithfully step out of the boat because that's where Jesus is. Wherever Jesus is, that's where we want to be. So maybe we try some new things in ministry. Maybe we look at church or at our discipleship in a new way. And we try to be like Peter. We try to be someone who recognizes things might be scary, but we're going to do it anyway. And we are going to go and be where Jesus is. We are going to walk like Jesus walked, even when it means stumbling in the middle of trying to walk on the water. But God is there in the storm with us. Jesus reaches out a hand to steady us. And for that, we truly give thanks. So go in peace this day, but be bold and courageous to fail forward faster and see where Jesus can lead you. Have a great week, and we will see you soon.